About 25 years ago, my father Jim and stepmother Susan built their dream home on Scarborough Hill, one of the coastal suburbs of Christchurch. They filled the house with New Zealand art, designer objects and furniture, an art lover's dream you might say. It was a true passion for both of them, a passion that they wanted to share. They loved inviting people into the house and planned that one day they might open it to the public. But in 2011, the earthquakes damaged the house beyond repair and the land was red zoned. But luckily most of the collection survived. So we immediately began planning for the new Ravenscar house. A decade later, Jim and Susan's vision became a reality with the opening of the Ravenscar house at 52 Rolleston Avenue in the central city. The new house was built by the family's charitable trust, which I chair, on land gifted by the Christchurch City Council. When it was completed last year, the house was gifted by the Trust to the Canterbury Museum to own and operate on behalf of the people of Christchurch. The Ravenscar House Museum is a treasure trove of Jim and Susan's art and other objects. I'm standing in a reimagining of their bedroom, which is filled with iconic paintings and other unique pieces, including this bedroom suite designed by David Lindley in London. Jim and Susan's vision was that the house itself would be a work of art. Designed by Patterson and Associates, that has certainly been achieved. Before we started building, Susan had the idea that a book would be written about this amazing story and chose Sally Blundell, an accomplished local author, to write it. Sally's done a superb job of writing the story and the book has been beautifully published by Canterbury University Press. On behalf of Jim and Susan's family and the Ravenscar Trust, I'd like to thank you for your interest in the Ravenscar House. We hope you enjoy the celebration of Jim and Susan's lives in this amazing story of Ravenscar House. Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai, and welcome to Ravenscar House in Christchurch. I'm Jo Malcolm, and tonight we're hosting a special event telling the story of this amazing space and the people behind it. I'm very excited to host this event, and I walked through the house just a few moments ago and got goosebumps looking at some of the amazing pieces of work on the walls in this very special place. But first, let's meet our guests. On my right is Sally Blundell, who's um, a local writer, editor, and has created this amazing book, Ravenscar House, a biography, which tells the story of how this place was created and the people behind it. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Warren Feeney on my left. Dr. Feeney has written about the visual arts and artists in Aotearoa for the past 35 years, has been a gallery director, and is a well-known publisher, bringing the, the monthly visual arts newspaper Artbeat to life in, in 2018. And finally, to my left, I have great pleasure in welcoming Frances Lodgkin, a member of the family of this house. She's Susan Wakefield's daughter, and is going to share with us stories of her mother and stepfather, Jim Wakefield, and why art had such a special place in their lives. Now, you've also got an incredibly impressive CV, Francis, but one thing that I picked up is that you're actually also um, learning how to be an art curator. I am, yes, and that was inspired by a trip that I took with Jim and Susan in 2008 to Europe, uh, which was my reintroduction to art after a long time away from it, and uh, I'll be forever grateful to them for that because it's brought me a lot of pleasure over the last 10 to 12 years' study. Now, sitting in this space, in this particular room, this must be incredible for you because it's very personal. This actually, this living room space, this furniture, you know. It is, and I do. There's a lovely feeling of familiarity for me um, throughout this whole building. Um, I walk into it and it wraps me in its arms because there are so many memories and I can sit in this room with its blue walls and feel um, relaxed and at peace and um, as if my, I would expect my mother to be sitting on the sofa opposite me reading a book as we used to do after dinner. It's incredible, isn't it? Like it's actually, it's, it's an art space, but it's so much more for you. It must evoke so many different memories. What can you see um, of your mum in the art on the walls? Um, I see the pieces that she particularly liked. I see, and with enormous thanks to the museum team, um, her 
aesthetic translated into this room, um, a lot of her sense of decorating style. And also, I have to say, Jim's as well, because they were a very well-matched pair. And the house that they built, the collection that they built, was all stuff that they liked and genuinely wanted to live with. So it's a great reflection, really, of both of them, each room in this house. It is very personal. I mean, the, the bedroom is remodelled. Is that a bit weird? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Uh, principally because I think because I find everything that's in it so beautiful. So yes, it's their bedroom, but you look at this amazing David Lindley furniture and this great art on the walls and genuinely think you think this is how they lived. This is not a... Um, a an amalgamation of things. It, genuinely, everything in the rooms they lived with, that was how it was arranged, and it was just part of their everyday life. So you grew up, um, you know, surrounded by art and art spaces? To an extent, yes. Um, Susan's real interest in art probably took off from the mid-1990s as she started to approach retirement, and she and Jim uh, worked out what they wanted to do with the next phase of their life, um, and certainly the houses that I visited in Auckland and then here in Christchurch, yeah, you got that sense always of living with the art, but very comfortably with the art. Do you think your mother had a particular, um, did she like to promote women artists? Is that a fair comment? There's certainly an element of that. There are some very significant women artists in the collection, and I think they were quite deliberately collected, um, in part because they were strong women artists. In terms of the significance of this, I mean, there is a lot of art in this house. It's a very unique collection of New Zealand art in a way, probably like, you know, unprecedented in New Zealand. I hope so. Um, <laughs> I hope that it reflects, it is, it is both a reflection of um, a wide canon of New Zealand art, um, Warren will be able to talk about that a lot more knowledgeably than me, um, but also the, the filter of Susan and Jim over that. So this is the collection that they built that they were most interested in, and it truly does reflect that. Um, we'll move on to Sally now with the book, and you have basically documented this whole journey that Susan and Jim went on, and Susan had a particular, um, she had a particular idea about what she wanted, didn't she? So tell me about how that started for you. It really started back in 2015, when the site that this house is on now was a car park, the city was still very much a broken city. There was rubble everywhere. There were road cones everywhere. We were living in a rental house while our house was being repaired. And Jim and Susan had recently bought a house further up the hill. And Susan knew my writing and rang us up for a cup of tea and asked, would, we, would I be interested in charting this in book form? Because she knew that she would never, she and Jim would never live here. She knew that building would be amazing and the architecture and the collection and the furniture would tell their story, but only as a glimpse, only as a, a ghosting, really, of their house on the hill and of their lives together. So the book, she hoped, would tell their story, tell their story, tell the story of the house on the hill, tell the story of the earthquakes, and tell the story of the development and the design process and the building of this building. So I was really tracking the, the, the building of this building through the book, which was fun. What attracted you to it? Like, what, what did you sort of pick up from Susan and, and what made you think this is a really interesting project to be part of? First, I really liked him and Susan. They were direct, they were honest, and they were so enthusiastic. I mean, they had moved into their third house since the earthquakes. Their treasured house on the hill was about to be demolished. They'd fought insurance battles. You know, things were pretty grim but they were so enthusiastic and positive about this new idea. And the idea itself is really unusual. I mean, every house museum is different, but they're all on this one continuum. And at the far end, you'll get a sort of museum-style building held in aspect with velvet cordons and not a thing ever out of place. And on the other end, you'll get a studio, a writer's studio, that looks as if somebody's just popped out for a cup of tea. So all of those types of house museums are evident in New Zealand. But they all, in New Zealand anyway, they all have a long, slow transition from house for several decades or centuries to house museum. This was a purpose-built house museum, which seems to be an absolute contradiction in terms. 
There was a similar one actually in, in Melbourne, the Leon House Museum. But it was so unusual a goal, really, for them and for the architects to say, right, we are going to design and build a building that will hold in it the memory of another building, which is very, very different, and the story of their lives. So this book really fills out that story that is glimpsed at so beautifully in this building. Why is this an important story for Christchurch, do you think? I think there was a big sense of, at the time of renewal, definitely straight after the earthquakes, this was a good news story. The city was really on hold, in a way. So um, the, no new development had really taken off, and everything was just what, waiting to see who was going to invest where. So here was a story, right, this is what we want to do, and we're going to really try and push through it. Also, it's a very contemporary building in a heritage precinct, which Christchurch has done before, and it's had its battles trying to do that, and many of those battles have been lost. So I think it was a good combination of a new building that is dedicated to art and architecture, just over the road from the Canterbury Museum, just over the road from the Art Centre, the new Christchurch Art Gallery just down the road, Coca just around the corner. So it adds another dimension to what is really an arts precinct in a very contemporary way. That is still a very sensitive nod to the architecture around it. What do you think when you see, I mean, you see the breadth of paintings on the walls, the art itself, in one small-ish space, compared with like yes. a, a massive gallery? It is really strange because for so long, as I was writing this book, I was working from photos. I had no sense of scale. I mean, I could see the dimensions, but I had no way to sort of translate what that would look like on the wall. So I researched and I wrote about them, and a lot of them I were familiar with, but seeing them all here, you, you do get quite overwhelmed with the scale of it, but also the scale of the, um, the idea of philanthropy and, and arts patronage, which I think New Zealand's got a rather funny attitude towards. It's, it's often done anonymously, yeah. below, the, below sort of the radar, but it's, this is a very out there presentation of that spirit, which I think is great. And it's very personal, isn't it? It is. It's so very personal. Absolutely, and as, as, as Francis said, you know, they had a commitment that the only thing they ever bought were works that they both liked, they both had to like it. But that said, Susan did her research, I mean, she had a whole folder of um, reviews and articles and asterisk comments. And she, I, th I think, I'd like to think that she approached her, the art collection in the same way that she probably approached her career with absolute sort of determination and meticulous attention to detail. Well, let's hear a little bit more about that. We're actually going to um, move over and talk to Frances, who's standing next to an extraordinary collection of glass. Francis, so this is called The Tribute to Mirandi. Um, tell us about this and the story of what happened on that fateful day in, in Christchurch of the earthquakes. So this is one of Susan's favourite pieces. Um, it is, as you've um, said, called Tribute to Mirandi. It's by a New Zealand glass artist called Wendy Fairclough, uh, who's based in South Australia these days. Um, and it's got a number of connections that make it very special to me as well. Uh, Susan bought it uh, from a gallery down in Dunedin when I was studying down there at the time. So I was with her when she first saw it and decided that it was a piece of glass that she really liked. Um, and it is, I mean, it is just a beautiful piece on its own. And then from there, its story grows and changes a little. Um, in the major earthquakes in Christchurch, I tend to look with a bit of a glare at one of our John Drawbridge paintings that Warren <laughs> will talk about in a little bit, um, because no fault of its own, but it came off the wall um, and fell onto tribute to Mirandi um, and swept it off the table that it was sitting on. Um, pretty much all of the white glass that you can see here broke. Uh, and so we were left with an incomplete tribute to Mirandi. Um, the spire on the oil can snapped off. So the pieces that we had were still a very nice work, but not complete. And as this building started to come to fruition and it became more likely that the project would get off the ground and be successful, I thought it would be a really nice um, tribute to uh, my mother and also to the project to see if we could get um, some work done. And so I was lucky enough to get in touch with Wendy 
um, who remembered the work very well and very kindly went back into car, uh, blow and glass work, um, which she had stopped doing, um, and remade all of the broken pieces for us and shipped them um, back over to us here in New Zealand. So, in a nutshell, this work tells kind of the whole story of the collection, a piece that was loved by the people who bought it, that was broken in the earthquakes, and that was repaired and now sits in this new reimagining of the original house. What do you love about the work, the glass? I, I love two things. I love the colours. It's very calm and serene, and I think that's something that really appealed to Susan about it as well. Um, and I like its quirkiness. There's a pot there's the oil can, just very common everyday objects, but that are absolutely beautiful in blowing glass. Do you have favourite works yourself? Do you want to reveal what they are? Sure. Uh, this is one of them. I am particularly fond of this. I think my other um, absolute favourite is one of the antiquities that Susan collected. Um, there is in the library what's called a folding rule, and it's a piece of um, bronze that folds out and latches open and gives you a foot once it's, and that you could literally use to measure things. It still functions, it still folds out and works, and I just, I love that. Thanks, Francis. I'll actually go back to Sally and ask about the, um, Susan's cur curiosity and inquisitiveness. Like, she did also collect antiquities. W what struck you about her personality in that way? She was always um, exploring and discovering, shall we say. She was, she was an old school, friend of, of Susan's, Mary Mountia, gave me access to the letters. They had a, a long correspondence over many years. And you get that sense of Susan, even as a student, a young, a, even when she was very young, being curious about the new town that she's just moved into and how many dairies there are and how many swimming <laughs> pools. And there was, a, there was an absolute curiosity that obviously did her very well as an academic. You know, she had a, has a PhD in, in Russian language and when she decided to move into accountancy. And I think she, she enjoyed that. I, I always had a sense that that's what she enjoys most about addressing a new topic. And so when she went into antiquities, and she was always interested in the classics, you know, she really researched it and she got good advice from people and she subscribed to the right magazines and read as much as she could. And she applied that to art and to even their philanthropic work, you know, they researched it. And I think when they retired and came to Christchurch, that sort of furious energy that they gave to their careers, they just phew, transferred that to their new house on the hill and became absolutely focused on that and down to the minor detail of an inlay on a, on a stair and a, which particular um, one of the, you know, Macau and Dubai or any of those things, she really, really researched it. And I think she really enjoyed it. And she was good at it. It was really um, a, you know, lifelong learning for them. And I think what strikes me about the house is it's not just about the art on the walls. You know, we've got the furniture. You know, we've got the library, which actually um, made me laugh when I saw the large number of cricketing books in the <laughs> library that... If you're a cricket buff, come down and you can sit in the library and read those books, you know, to your heart's content, con, um, content. But also, actually, the large number of books about, you know, the classics and the antiquities. It was a they were lifelong learners, weren't they? Yes, very much so. Um, let's actually discuss some of the art on the walls, um, and we'll talk to Dr. Warren Feeney here. You know, I look around and you know I see rock star paintings here. I can recognise a lot of these names. Tell me about the importance of this collection in terms of New Zealand art collections in Christchurch. In Christchurch? Well, yes, or New Zealand, or we'll start okay. with Christchurch. Yeah, um, I think, I, I mean, there are, well, the collections, there, there are collections that are large in, in terms of the representation of New Zealand artists right throughout, right throughout the country, um, from Auckland, you know, Right through and down past Dunedin, I think that um, I think with this collection, what I mentioned, what's really interesting is the um, it's in, it's actually the, for me it's a really tight collection, as in all the works do have a sense of belonging together and and actually visually, lots of conversations going on between them and they it's it's been you know I think really nicely beautifully curated 
And it's essentially this history. Um, no, I shouldn't say it's, a, it's a, just a history, but a, a big part of it is 19, uh, 20th century you know, New Zealand art. And actually the relationship, I think, between Europe, modernism, how it emerged in America, but also in, through Europe, and how New Zealand made sense of that. And it's really perfectly represented by the presence of Hodgkins right through the building. You know, there are 10 works, and they are they're very good works. And my feelings is just I love the way that they sit with all the other works. Um, you know, Sidney Thompson, Hodgkins, and Rona Hazard. You've got three people who are expatriate artists, um, and put them side by side, and in, in the gallery spaces here, and they work really well. You know, they're sharing a lot of ideas and um, values and beliefs about modernism and its importance, and ways in which it can become uh, an important critical aspect of New Zealand art you know, right so, through to recent, recent works as well. So one thing that you've alluded to, which I think is really interesting, is um, tell me about your impression of how it's displayed here, because it is, in a sense, an inner house setting. Mm, yes. What, what do you think of that? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question, because, uh, you know, the whole, if you go into public galleries, the walls are white, the work is the absolute focus. That's where, and it, it, that's not a bad thing. That's where it begins and ends. It's about the, the physicality of the work, um, the aesthetics, the materials, the subject, and it's it's isolated in a way that they aren't here, where where in fact they are in a home environment. And I think what's really a, one of the things I really like about that it's it's a nice reminder that um, you know artwork. Um, leaves it out of the studio, it has a life of its own. And actually, that's what it does when it goes into your home. You know, they become old friends um, eventually, and young friends as well. But it's about the way in which arts, artworks speak back to people and they have a relationship with it. And that's, it's a different aspect of something that an artwork can give you in a gallery, and both of them are really important. The notion of the work having a place in somebody's life, you know, in a really personal way and meaningful way, that's every bit, that's why people collect art and that's why they go and see it in galleries as well. You know, it's, there are, there, they are different aspects and um, it's actually, it's, it's nice that this is, this is here in Christchurch because it's, it is quite different. There isn't a comparable model for it actually, is there? Mm. Um, so that in itself, I think, is one of the strengths. I mean, coming through and, and uh, going through and looking at the whole collection and looking at it, hopefully, very carefully, a couple of weeks ago, um, I did feel a gallery experience happening. It, it had a lot of those same, uh, the connections made between various works, the relationships between artists, and the notion of the way in which the groupings actually, in, in, in the house, there is this, you know, there's a space there for Scarborough and Sumner paintings, which I, I really like. That works really well together. And that's something that a, a public gallery would do, but it can also be done here and, and sit really comfortably as well. I'm actually just going to jump to Francis for a minute there because, you know, they must have had massive walls in their house. They had so <laughs> they much art. Where did all the art go? It was a little bit of a challenge in coming down here um, because we have less wall space here than they had up in the house in Scarborough. Um, so, in fact, in the house in less Scarborough... Less wall space here? Less wall space here, yes. Wow. So, up in the house in Scarborough, things would have been a little more spread out. Um, but the wall behind me, for example, are all works that were in the living room. And some of them, the three McCarns you can see behind me, were hung like that in the living room. So we've tried to translate that where we can. Um, so they had a lot of fun arranging things in the house. And I gather the art in the bedroom was in the bedroom, yes. in the house. Yes, so the um, hang of the paintings over the bed itself it replicates uh, what was there. Um, the uh, trio that Warren was just talking about in the dining room, again, that's how they were arranged in the dining room at the house, so they've been rehung. So there's so much of Susan and Jim and their curation here, as well as the work of the museum team and a couple of us from the Trust who worked with them to curate it. Um, you've got a very impressive um, list of achievements, um, but one thing I must admit, Sally, when I um, read the book was I found Jim and Susan's achievements almost 
<laughs> I, felt, I felt quite sort of they hadn't really achieved much in my own <laughs> life because... Did you have that impression that they, they, they achieved so much? They did. And it was interesting going back to their early childhoods. And I must say, when I first started talking to Jim and Susan, they wanted this to be about them and the old house and new house. But actually, when we started having quite a few cups of tea and talked about their childhood, they, they were very generous with their time, but I think they really wanted to get on with the exciting bits and start talking about this house. So I had to sort of keep pulling them back and pulling them back. But they both came from very humble backgrounds. Um, Susan was five when she came out um, from England with her parents to start and look for a new job and a new life. And um, Susan's father got tra trained as a teacher here, and then their family moved to, from Plymouthton to Dupuki down to Christchurch. And Jim was a child of the Depression and grew up in Timaru. And he gives a lovely story of you know, things were really tough, but um, there were lots of children at the school with, that didn't have shoes, and he always had shoes. So they were, you know, they came from fairly poor backgrounds, but at the same time, it sounds like both sets of parents imbued in them a sense of self-betterment. Definitely Susan's parents did, and so it was all about training, learning, keep going. And Susan, she was the oldest, she was the oldest daughter, there were no sons, and so those expectations might have been even higher. So she did extremely well academically at school and at university. Couldn't work at university because her first husband was already working there and they had a law saying you can't, you're all saying you can't both work in the same institution. And so that's when she embarked on an accountancy um, court study, which again, she did very well. And she met Jim, who was working his way up again, dramatically, quickly, through the accountancy profession. And then when they moved to Auckland, Jim went into private business, and Susan did for a while as well, but then took on the chair of the Commerce Commission, mainly from talking to Francis, actually. From I just realised how desperately busy they were. I mean, mm -hmm. they worked so, so hard. Mm -hmm. And there was that sense of never really wanting to stop. I mean, I think retirement was never going to be put your feet up and do a crossword puzzle, <laughs> really. <laughs> this is, I think this is what struck me when, um, you know, I was going through the, um, the story in the book, is that um, there was this, this enormous passion and zest for life. And, you know, I think um, one of the photos that really stood out for me, Sally, was that one of, you know, Susan standing there with these men surrounding her, and she's the oh. only woman. And yes. boy, oh boy, she was quite a staunch customer, wasn't she? And even She knew what she wanted. That's right. <laughs> and even in the accountancy department at university, there would have been very few women, mm. and in the profession as a whole. It was mm. very much a male preserve. And, you know, I think um, there was so much hard work that they both, um, you know, their careers were so dominating that in a weird kind of way, I sort of felt like the art was this, not relief or sort of, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a more lighter passion? What do you think? I think so, and I think it, I mean, it evolved over time. So as Sally described, through their business life, they were incredibly busy and incredibly driven, both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they put a lot of energy and effort into it. And they had, dis, they had started to uh, develop, I guess, a, a, a more relaxed side in terms of the house that they renovated in Auckland, for example. That was probably the start of it. And I think it grew from there. So as business interests wound down, um, interests in things like the art collection, uh, building this amazing house in Christchurch, um, for my mother, uh, going back to the classics at university. Um, as, as we were saying, lifelong learning is a good way really to describe both of them. So we're now going to talk to our art expert and we're actually going to give you a wee sneak peek of some of these amazing um, artworks. So we'll just step over here to look at some of them. Um, now, Dr Feeney, we've got basically a rock star painting here. Yeah. This is a hotary. This um, is Ralph Hotary. <coughs> tell me about me. this. Yeah, this is um, it's working painting for a large panel. And, um, <laughs> Which it, is a little bit of a boring name for such a beautiful painting, but... It is, it is. Um, but, it, yeah, it's an interesting painting because it's, all, it's so, uh, you know, just 1970, uh, 71, and it really is also wonderful evidence of just how 
uh, mature New Zealand painting had become by then in terms of its engagement with international modernism. This is geometric abstract painting and it's a beautiful, well-refined work by, um, by Hotary. And it's been here in Christchurch before, which is I just, I just think such a neat story around it because it was here in uh, 1971 in an exhibition at the at Coker Gallery, which was in the Canterbury Society of Arts, and it had come in a touring show from the um, Auckland Art Gallery who had decided they wanted to put together a show called Ten Big Paintings by Ten New Zealand Artists. And the premise of that show was to actually prove or, or just good, good evidence that New Zealand actually had a very mature contemporary painting scene that compared well internationally. And um, yeah, the work was in a space at Coca, the large gallery up space upstairs, which was perfectly, in a way, almost designed for works on that scale and of that type. So here it is now, and it's 50 years later, and it's just around the corner from um, Coca Gallery. So it's interesting. I, I, I like the notion of it having been here and returning 50 years later, actually. Uh, and it's just such a... It's of that period, but it still holds... still a very beautiful, minimalist and interesting painting. And you can see those influences of people like Chad and what was going on in America, what was going on in Britain. And I think those connections particularly with Europe especially, are really, again, I've mentioned they are through many of the works that are in the collection by New Zealand artists. Now, you talked um, before about paintings almost talking to each other. Um, yeah. Our neighbour here is a, uh, a very mm -hmm. interesting work. Um, this is Reuben Patterson. This is Reuben Patterson, yeah. and this, has a, this work has a fantastic title, Your Pants Are Putting On an X-Rated Show. Mm. So... <laughs> I don't know that we need this kind of, actually, it sort of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Like um, Glitter it, Paisley. Yeah, I think regardless of the title, it definitely speaks for itself. <laughs> um, it's interesting, too, because uh, in terms of, um, you know, this was done in 2003, and the title of, of the painting itself really gives a sense, here's an artist who's really hit his moment, and he <laughs> knows it, he's confident, and the title's um, kind of loud, dismissive, and, and rowdy, and it's, it's <laughs> deliberately so. But so is the painting, isn't it? The glitter and um, the paisley patterns, which are so 70s. It's definitely a look at me painting. <laughs> so let's um, move is. around here, and this um, walking through here, we're just passing. We won't um, stop for too long, but we're passing Macan's, where, you know, so if you just um, mm. pop over there and we'll have a chat about this amazing painting here, and I'm mm. going to display a little bit of art knowledge in the sense I'm, there's a Matisse in the middle. This is, yes, a Matisse figure, and the painting's interior with Matisse. And this is John Drawbridge, Wellington-based artist. And um, actually, it's an interesting work because it's around 1980, and, you know, I'd mentioned the collection itself. There's a strong link between European artists and the notion of the, the way in which the modern movement developed in New Zealand. And, and here you have... Uh, this, uh, John Drawbridge in 1980, Matisse being a favourite artist. So we have a European artist in the work and it has those geometric abstract forms as well. It's a, it's a wonderful work. I think one of the strengths of this work too is the fact that it is, we know we're in a room, um, there's a figure and there's possibly there's another figure here as well. And Almost like a ghost, is that like an observer or a... It's, yes, it's it is, and it's you know, somebody coming and going. And so, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, subject in the sense that it's moving between being abstract, geometric, and then also figurative. So there's a storyline, but it's very oblique. And that's one of the wonderful things that paintings do. They don't give up the whole story. They're giving you hints and clues and inviting you in. And then, I mean, it's one of those works, I think, with this one where, you know, you'll go back to it again, you'll go back to it again, and it's going to be giving new thoughts and new ideas every time. I mean, I love the spatial ambiguities of it too, and the fact that there's still life here as well. It makes absolute sense, but it's actually far bigger than being about making absolute sense. Yeah. Now, if we move on to this wall here, um, tell me about... I know that you're quite affected by this one. Yes, this is um, Raymond McIntyre. It's a self-portrait, and um, he's an expatriate artist, so again, we have this connection between international and local. And, um, yeah, I think it's a really striking portrait uh, by um, the artist, a self-portrait in which 
he's, I mean, the, the, there's nothing grand about the gesture. It's very inward looking and very um, reflective. And it's, it seems very, he seems very distant, but it's actually also very, a very compelling and attractive. Um, it's hard to be drawn away, to, to get away from it. it it's really, very sad. He's got yeah. such an extraordinarily sad face. Yes. But it's, you know, the simultaneous, it's difficult not to absolutely like the figure and feel empathy for the situation too. It's a, again, this notion of coming back to the work and the work itself, it's, you know, you come to it each time and it seems anew, here he is, and there's this, you know, this feeling, this mood that he's conveying. You can um, see, can you see why that Jim and Susan were attracted to some of these works when you look oh, at them? Oh, absolutely. This is a really, again, a very striking and... and uh, really very memorable sort of an image and again it's, it's going to continue to sustain interest. I think you said to me before you thought this was his best work. Yes I do, yeah absolutely, it's a wonderful work by him uh, and yeah it's a, I mean I think one of the things that makes it an empathetic piece is it's very much the artist admitting I'm, I'm only human <laughs> and I have these days, these moments and it can, it's conveyed with such depth and feeling. It's a wonderful painting. Thank you for that Warren. We'll take our seats again and we'll have some more discussions because there's plenty of artworks here but we actually only really want to give people a sneak peek because they'll have to come down and see some of these amazing artworks for themselves. Um, I'm going to ask you Francis, what, I'm not going to ask you to tell a funny story but what really stays with you about um, Susan and Jim? What sort of, what do you remember the most? I think my memories, and particularly when I come into the house, are the, the small moments of life in the house. So uh, right up the top of the house accessed from the master bedroom, there was an area that Susan called the crow's nest, um, which was a smallish room in the grand scheme of the house, but planted right on top. So it had 360 degree views of Pegasus Bay and out across the godly heads and across the city. Um, and it was painted completely white, but it was her space where there was some modernist furniture, um, there was the, some of the glass that she loved, there were family mementos, and she used to sit there and relax when she took the time to doing things like jigsaw puzzles. So there'd be this great jigsaw puzzle <laughs> laid out across the table <laughs> and her working away meticulously to fit everything in. Um, it's small memories like that, it's the memories of them shutting up the house each night. So they'd go downstairs and they'd close the panel doors that led to the day room and lock up the doors and close off all the kind of little different bits of the treasure box that was the house and then retire upstairs. It just those sorts of memories are really nice. They, you know, what, what really strikes me is that um, they had an enormous sense of sharing and giving. Absolutely, yeah. Where did that come from? Um, was it because perhaps they had mod they came from modest backgrounds and now they wanted to sort of share it or what? Possibly yes, and I think they were very uh, aware of uh, the collection that they had built up and how much um, pleasure they had got from it. Um, and I think the idea that it could be broken up, uh, sold or put into a collection and lost in a, in a larger collection, um, I think particularly for Susan that probably kind of physically hurt as an idea. Um, and Jim, of course, was very devoted to her and wanted, and they both wanted to be happy with what happened with the collection. And so I think this idea of gifting, essentially, the house um, to the city was their way of ensuring that this great thing that they had put together was kept together and that so many other people got to experience it and hopefully to enjoy it and love it as much as they did. They'd love the idea that people really loved the art, wouldn't they? That Absolutely. That would really appeal yes, to them. Yeah. And we were very fortunate that um, on the day of the opening here we were able to bring Susan through um, to see the realisation of her vision and it was lovely. She um, was very conscious of I think where they'd started and so very pleased with where we had ended up. Oh that's lovely. Yeah. Um, moving back to Sally, what were you left with when finishing the book? What did you have a sense of? Was it the sort of the, the art or was it the people? But in, a, in a way, I think everything that Warren and Francis have been saying shows the success of the architecture because it was an incredibly challenging proposition to have a very contemporary building that had to allude to a 
very different Frank Lloyd Wright inspired house on the hill have their art collection and their furniture inside it and sort of have those glimpses of them while being something completely different. And both Su Susan and Jim were determined it wasn't to be a replica, it had to be something new and modern. And I think this house feels mysterious. Even though it's brand new, it feels like it's got memories in it, which is, I tried to explain that and try to understand that when I was writing the book. And it feels like a, a building with a roof on top that's been swiveled around so you get you know, everything pitches at an angle and you get strange shadows and lights and one doorway sort of always leads you onto the next doorway. And the impluvium in the middle, which sort of gets holds all the rainwater. And it's a very beguiling house, which I know is a kind of overused word, but I think that's a good description of it. And how Paston Associates did that on quite a sort of important site in the middle of, in the middle of Christchurch. So there are lots of eyes watching, I think is a huge testament to them and their relationship with Jim and Susan as well. Because it's actually, um, it's not only inside, it's outside. There's beautiful sculptures in the garden. There are. You know, the garden's been beautifully designed because sculpture was a big part of the yeah. house as well, wasn't it? And the garden does, I mean, Susan was very keen that this be a house in the garden, as, as the first Ravenscar house was. And so Suzanne Turley in Auckland was a landscape designer, and she's, again, echoed some of the garden on the hill. And Andrew Patterson used a nice um, analogy with the artist Rachel Whiteread, who did a, um, filled a whole house, actually, with plaster of Paris. And that was the artwork. So it was this impossible to get into, but it kept all the indents and the patina of the old house. And I think that's what this house does so well. It evokes another story that isn't terribly blatant or obvious. It's very subtle, but it's very beautiful. Um, Sally, you've done, I mean, you, you're a journalist, you've done lots of other things. How, you, you were basically completely, you know, ensconced in this whole project. How does it compare with other things that you've done? With a project like this, I mean, often you start, even if you're writing short articles or longer feature articles, you start at the beginning or you start at the end. <laughs> Whereas this gave me the opportunity, because of the timing really, to begin right at the beginning when they hadn't even completely secured a site and the design hadn't been finalised, and then to work through that process. And as Jim and Susan got older, they handed over more responsibility to, to a younger generation, so Steve Wakefield and Francis and the Ravenscar Trust, and then the Canterbury Museum came in and their curatorial team. So it was sort of felt like marching alongside the development of a house, which is something you don't tend to get to do as a journalist. What's your favourite room? My favourite room? I think it's the dining room. I think it's the... Uh, there's a... You know, the deep colour and the lushness, but also beautiful, beautiful artworks. And one of my favourite works in this collection is Leo Bensman's Watercolour of Taylor's Mistake, which is this exquisite little mm. unusual painting. And so even though it's quite a dramatic room, there's a lightness of the, in the artwork. Thank you, Sally. And thank, thank you. you so much to our amazing guests for sharing some stories and um, taking us on this journey of this beautiful, beautiful place. I, you feel like you could spend hours here and I guess every time you come back you see something different, which is kind of what you were saying with art galleries, where that you come in and you see something and you see something else another oh, day. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's amazing. And I love the concept of what you were talking about, is that uh, the art talking to each other. I love mm. that concept of, you know, what the McCarns might be saying to the next door neighbour. <laughs> Actually, I, I would like to say too, I think what Sally was saying about the Bensimmon, that is a, that's an amazing work. Mm. The, you know, the Scarborough one, it's a fantastic piece, it really is. I think um, someone told me that the, um, was it the McCann, one of Taylor's mistake, or someone was one of Susan's favourite paintings? One of Jim's favourites. Jim's favourite. Mm. Yes, so it's right. a painting that's hanging in the bedroom. It's a view across the heads from Taylor's Mistake to Godly Head. Um, and it um, reflects very much the view from their master bedroom. And it hung in the bedroom. So you could sit on the bed and look straight out at the view. And if you turned your head to the left, you could see McCann's representation of it. That's pretty special. Very special. <laughs> that's very <laughs> special.
I must admit, in the museum, as particular, in the house museum, particularly in the bedroom, I thought, are you allowed to sit on the bed? <laughs> What's that? Because the bed's actually a David Lindley bed. Yes. And these sofas that we're sitting on are from some amazing French. They're from Hugh Chevalier in uh, Paris. So we're privileged to be sitting on things tonight. I was going to say, <laughs> unfortunately, sitting on these <laughs> Um We're going to actually um, address a couple of questions that we've had sent in from those who are watching. Um, the first one is for you, Francis, um, which is, I understand the collection was shaped by an agreement that both collectors, Jim and Susan, liked each work they acquired. Were there any exceptions to this rule? Or, not, and did they have to do a bit of horse trading, aren't you? Um, not that I know of. Um, my overwhelming, and it will be my lifelong impression of them, is how well they were matched. Um, and yes, there would have been uh, robust discussions about <laughs> a number of things through their life. Uh, but I think around the art in particular, there was always a degree of agreement between them. And Sally and I have both seen correspondence with John Gow, who worked with them a lot, where he was offering them a painting. And they had written back and said, it's a very nice painting, but it's not something that we particularly like. And we will not buy something that we don't like and want to live with. Both of us. Both of us, yes. Was always that they needed to be in agreement about the art. That's actually quite extraordinary that they had a similar taste in art because art can be so personal, can't it? Yes. I mean, there are areas of the collection that are a focus for one or other of them. As we've talked about, the antiquities were definitely something that was yeah. more of an interest for Susan. Um, and Jim had his favourite artworks within the collection. Um, but I think they married their tastes together very well. Great. Okay, so the next question is for Sally. Why do you feel that Susan and Jim were so determined to present this valuable collection to the people of Christchurch in the way they did? I think in a way Francis has answered some of that already, and I think they, didn't, they definitely wanted to keep the collection together. Um, they didn't want it to be split up or to be pulled out for sort of a best-of collection. And I think they did want to keep the idea of a collection in a house in a garden. That was something that meant so much to them and that they created to be like that. I mean, it came together so beautifully in the house on the hill. I think that's what they wanted to preserve and give other people an opportunity to see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, and the last question is for Warren. Um, how unusual is it for art collections to be gifted as a whole collection, like how unusual is that to a city? Would yeah, you give I'm it back? trying to think of one at the moment. And um, yeah, there are collections. There are there are there are examples, and that there are exceptions. I think most of them, especially over the last 10, 15 years, tend to go through the auction houses, and they are the so-and-so collection and their that title and name. I mean, you would have seen that following the auction, auction houses, webs, and art and object. That's very much a key focus to have a whole collection gives value to to all of it. But yeah, gifting it to um, gifting it to a city is quite, I think, pretty. I'm trying to think of an example right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say the it's spot. exceptional. <laughs> I put you on the spot, but it is very special. Yeah, I'm it? thinking that there are examples where where a body of work is gifted, an artist will often, that's probably more likely an artist, an artist. their estate will gift their estate to a gallery. Um, but that's a different, that's very different. Yeah. How much do you think, this is my question actually, um, how much do you think you can tell about people by the art that you see? Do you think you get a oh, sense? Oh, everything, absolutely. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I know, comprehensively so. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think that's very true from you know um, what's been said this evening about this collection. Yeah, um, no, I mean it. It is about people making good decisions about what they want to have in their home. And actually, that relationship, I wouldn't, you know, absolutely not to be underestimated because good works sustain their interest. You go back to them, you discover them, and you you find interesting things that you know why you like them, and you know. I mean, it's the longevity of them that I think that's so important. It anchors you in something that's a significant part of your life. And um, it can change, the works can change in the way you read them. But yeah, good artworks are there for the long haul as much as you are. Thank you. 
So this brings us to the end of our live event. I want to thank everyone um, who's watched this, and I also want to thank our guests. Um, basically, it is to celebrate this wonderful book, thank you. as well as celebrate this house. Um, Sally's book is available at bookstores, is that right, mm -hmm. Sally, yes. as of now? Yes. yes. You can also um, buy a copy here at Raven's Car House, and if you do buy a copy of the book here, um, the proceeds go towards the running cost of Raven's Car House. And it's also actually a beautiful um, reminder of the collection. So if you come and visit the collection, um, you can actually take the book as, as I have. When you go home, you can then sort of almost go through it all, all over again and read all the lovely little anecdotes that you've got in the book. It's a fabulous one. So for those of you in Christchurch or even in New Zealand, if you're visiting Christchurch, do come and visit Raven's Car House. It's a really, truly wonderful experience and you need to block out a few hours of the day. Um, lastly, I really want to thank the late Jim and Susan Wakefield, who I really hope has the opportunity to watch this, Susan. You are both extraordinary people. Your curiosity, your passion for New Zealand art, and above all, your generosity and foresight will never be forgotten. Na mihi nui, good night from us all. <laughs>